Now, may I invite our guest of honour, Senior Minister Taman Shamagaratnam and Professor Chan Heng Chi to join us on stage, please. Must be one of the larger gatherings of people around dining tables, but without food on it. <laughs> yeah. Oh, good afternoon, uh, Senior Minister Taman, Jane Itogi, Mildred Nutatan, Chairman of Tok Board, Professor Chung Kun Hien, Chairman of uh, Lee Kuan Yew Center for Innovative Cities and Janadas Devon, IPS. Ladies and gentlemen, um, I want to say on behalf of all of us uh, how delighted we are, uh, Senior Minister, that you are joining us today here to help us launch the, social, the Future Ready uh, Society Impact Fund. This means a lot to the two academic institutions and to the board, and I'm sure to all the future stakeholders in this sort of future-ready research. Uh, we are here to talk about the future and being future-ready. Many thoughtful people have drawn our attention to the grave problems that face us in the coming years and decades. And you gave a very powerful speech last November, which you titled The Perfect Long Storm. And you reminded us in your remarks that it is extremely important for us to diagnose and characterize the uncertainties and the difficulties very clearly. Because unless we do that, we cannot find the solutions properly. And you have also highlighted then, and it strikes me because I'm a political scientist and a diplomat, that multilateralism Mobilizing countries to work together for planet Earth is very important, but we have also to mobilize our own people. So I'm going to start with one long question, which is really several questions put together. Yeah? Do you think Singaporeans fully grasp the coming scenario of the perfect long storm, as you see it? You know? um, are we ready? And also, who are the future? Where are the future ready societies? What can we name a couple, you know, and what can we learn from them? And I'd like to also add this. We emphasize future readiness a lot. Mildred does that, you know. But I don't want to say, are we overrating it? Because that would sound ungracious, yeah? But I want to be the devil's advocate. You know, Singapore separated from Malaysia in 1965. It was an unknown unknown. Our leaders weren't prepared for it. But we didn't do too badly, you know. Yeah, we landed on our feet. Singapore is an economic success. So uh, I'm asking, we weren't future ready we just cross the river by feeling the stones. So were we resilient or were we future ready? How do you think we did so well? So, I mean, that's the first big question with many small questions. Okay, no, very, very interesting um, uh, framing of the issue, uh, Heng Chi. Um, first, of course, uh, nothing equals the challenge of being a country, becoming a country, which people expect to fail, 1965. Nothing beats that. Uh, but it is a fundamentally different challenge that we face today. And I'll explain it in uh, two different ways. First, and by the way, I should also say that although you say, well, we succeeded, you know, crossing the river, feeling the stones. But 
we actually beat the odds. We were not expected to reach the bank on the other side. We actually beat the odds. So it is a perilous uh, set of circumstances. Um, and it's not as if countries faced with that situation uh, taking the approach of, well, let's cross the river feeling the stones, will succeed. Some will, with unusual leadership and unusual set of um, an, an unusual ability of people to rally together, uh, but most won't. But just leaving that historical episode aside, which has no equal, it has no equal. I would say fundamentally what we face today is the known unknowns are largely global. Some of them are domestic within societies, including even in our own society. But we now have fundamental challenges which are global in nature. That's not what we faced in 1965. We were landed with a, in perilous circumstances as a tiny new nation state. But the rest of the world just didn't bother. It wasn't their problem. Now we have a global problem of a global nature requiring global solutions. And it's going to affect all of us. Southeast Asia, by the way, is going to be the, one of the most vulnerable states as climate change progresses. Uh, the combination of the climate crisis, a global water cycle that's now gone out of kilter, and the loss of biodiversity, that combination is going to affect Southeast Asia in a more pronounced way than most other regions. So these are global problems which are coming to a lake and to a field close to where you live. They are local, but global in origin. And that's new because the world, you know, multilateralism and national governance was never really fitted out to deal with problems of that nature. The multilateral institutions, the World Bank, the IMF, the various other multilateral development banks, were there to solve national problems, uh, help countries develop after the Second World War, subsequently after the Cold War. Uh, they were there to solve national problems. They depended on aid budgets. Now we need a very different orientation because although there are still national problems and regression in many parts of the world, moving backwards in domestic governance and political infighting and so on, the largest challenges we face are global and it's tackling the global challenges collectively with every nation pulling their weight that's going to get us out of the prospect of a very dire future. So that's the first big difference between the situation we face now with the situation any nation faced in the 60s, 70s, 80s. Global public goods are in short supply. And the multilateralism we need to invest in global public goods is in short supply at a time when the demand for it is greater than ever before. And we have to play their part, our part. As a small country, we have to play our part by supporting and investing in multilateralism. And we have to play our part by way of what we do domestically as well, how we ourselves make a transition in the way we live. We started early on water because we were more water constrained than most countries one of the most water-constrained countries in the world, in fact. So we started early there, innovating, making ourselves, uh, developing a resilient national system. But climate change is now on us. The loss of biodiversity in the region as a whole and globally is going to compound that, and the effects will be increasingly seen everywhere. So we all have to make adjustments. Secondly, the point I'd make about the perfect long storm is that it's not just bad luck. It's not about bad actors and bad events. There's no lack of bad act actors in the world. But it's not just that. The situation we are facing is not idiosyncratic. It's not just circumstantial. It's not just an accidental confluence of events. It's actually a structural insecurity that now besets the world. We're in for many years now of insecurity, 
in many dimensions, economic, ecological and social, because ultimately it will come back down to what happens in our own societies. And that combination of economic, ecological and social insecurity is not a passing phase. It's going to be with us for some time to come. And that's what I mean by perfect long storm. We haven't had it before. And we need solutions globally and multilaterally, as well as nationally, that allow us to prepare in advance for the shocks that are coming. Because pandemics will recur, economic crises will recur, and the geopolitics is working in a way where accidents can happen. And even if they don't actually happen, you don't get a major flare-up, the increased tensions have consequences for everything else. Consequences for economies, consequences for our ability to just uplift ordinary people's lives. So we have to prepare for this new phase. And it requires, well, you asked a long question, I'm giving you a long answer. Yeah, uh, no, it's fine. It, I it, was going to ask more questions. It, it requires, you know, you have, you have, um, you talk about future ready. In truth, of course, the future is largely about known unknowns. It's not fully known and unknown unknowns. Mm -hmm. But what we need to develop is resilience, social and economic resilience. That's what we need to develop. And it requires being preparing in advance for the known unknowns, preparing in advance for the fact that there will be another pandemic. We don't know when it'll come. It could be next year, by the way, or it could be in 10 years' time. It could be much worse than COVID. It could be much worse than COVID. So treat COVID as a dry run and prepare in advance now. That's what we are doing in Singapore. In fact, we were somewhat better prepared than most countries for COVID because we had had SARS and we put in place the NCID and many other, we even had stockpiling of essential uh, medical supplies and so on and so forth. But we've learned a lot from COVID. And we want to en ensure that the lessons from COVID are now used to develop resilience for the future because the future could be much worse than before. And I'm just giving the example of pandemics. There are other challenges we face as well. So we nationally and countries collectively, globally, have to pay more attention to prevention and pre preparation for future shocks, rather than lurch from one crisis to another and respond after crises hit us. If we just keep responding to crises once they hit us, first, it's extraordinarily expensive. The cost to human lives is too great. And very importantly, it just eats away at optimism in society. It's a, it creates a very different social psychology, preparing in advance at much lower cost, knowing that it could come and it could hit you, creates resilience, and it gives you a very different mood in society, a willingness to take the crises when they come, find ways of rallying together, and find ways of bouncing back. Whereas if you just lurch from one crisis to another, and you drain down your national budgets and reserves one country after another, in most countries by borrowing, and you have to make trade-offs in the middle of a crisis that give some people something and deny other people the same benefits, it just eats into trust and it eats into optimism. And if you look at the surveys done today, mm. yeah. Pew Global Research and others, some countries found COVID, the COVID experience in many countries was a divider. They've ended up more divided. A few countries, including Singapore, have ended up more united. Yeah. Now that's not something that comes by chance. We don't summon up trust in a crisis. I mean, no political leadership anywhere in the world can just summon it up in, the cri in a crisis. You've got to build it during peacetime. You've got to build it in the years in between crises. You've got to build it up continually. Constant communication, constant listening, constant empowering of people, developing of expertise. You've got to build it up in peacetime. Yeah. And that way, when a crisis hits, you're able to respond in a way that unites people and not divides them. Yeah. Uh, well, thank you, uh, Senior Minister. I will be drilling down later with you on some of the things we could do, because I think that's what 
the audience would be interested in. But before we leave for the more detailed question, can I just pursue this a bit further? You are absolutely right. In Singapore, we underestimate how well we have done and how resilient we have been over the pandemic and how we've dealt with the crises. What are the other examples, one or two, of countries that have been future ready, able to deal with crisis? Because I think it's important for our researchers because they too should look at some of those countries to raise some of the questions. You know, you give them an idea what to look at. Well, COVID, like I guess any major crisis, has turned out to be a huge global laboratory uh, that now requires testing of theories and explanations. There are many things that were unexpected. For instance, um, conventional wisdom has always been that if you look at Europe, the Northern Europeans are more stoic, it's a higher degree of social trust. Uh, the Southern Europeans, bless them, are less disciplined, um, you know, less willing to put up with um, uh, measures that require collective um, collaboration. Uh, it was always a bit of a trope, but you know, that was the conventional wisdom. You find it in the way in which media articles are written. You know, Portugal, Spain, and so on are always written about in a certain way compared to uh, the Germans and um, many of the other Northern Europeans. It's fascinating how in COVID, the dissension over whether to wear masks, whether to get vaccinated, the strength of anti-vaccine movements was much stronger in Germany than in Spain. In fact, Spain turned out to be a really br a bright star in Europe. Everyone complied. Wearing masks, going for vaccinations, everyone went along and complied. That's just one example. Spain. Spain, yeah. And there are other examples as well that just went against the grain of conventional wisdom. So there's a lot we do not understand of what social norms are really like. What social norms are really like. And social norms in peacetime may be different from social norms in crisis. Mm. Now, obviously, the politics matters. Um, if you have coalition governments where political parties are themselves taking quite different positions, it's a real problem. If you've got a very strong, uh, well, I mean, there were some governments in some of the most mature democracies who also had uh, wonky views on COVID and its cures. But, so politics matters. But I think this has turned out to be a huge laboratory for social analysis a more sociological study, more political sociology study, and more study of what really goes on on the ground in neighborhoods between people. Why did trust dissipate in some societies and trust get forged in others? I mean, in Singapore, we've ended up with a higher level of trust, a higher level of unity. Not just people with government, which was high, but also actually people amongst people. There's just a greater sense that everyone's playing their role. And I could see it in my own constituency. Elderly people, all walks of life, most of them, you know, have had very modest lives. Each time you have a booster, the word goes out, everyone just turns up. They see their neighbours going. Sometimes the machi will bring the elderly Chinese neighbour together with them. Everyone just goes. Because you're doing it, I'm doing it, we'll all be better off. Yeah, now, you touched on the mores, social mores in, what is it in Spain? What are their mores that make them different? And you speak of Singapore's, you know, how Singaporeans reacted during the pandemic. That was exactly what I did want to move into because the ambition of the Lee Kuan Yew uh, LKYC, IC, IPS, and the Tote Board program is to really try to transform. You know, how are we going to transform the social system 
so that we become far more supportive. And uh, you've indicated, Senior Minister, that in your constituency, you've seen some very positive reactions. Is that deep or is it shallow? Because I always had the idea, and I think some social scientists around have the same idea, that in Singapore, we are very good at building the hardware. The software still needs development. We have to develop that. And by the software, I mean you know, the habits of working together, the habits of helping each other. You have said in one of your speeches, we should be our brother's keepers. You know? The habit of self-help. Robert Bella, the uh, well-known American sociologist, spoke about habits of the heart, you know, which is really your ways of doing things. It becomes part of your life, your mores, in a sense. And in every society, there are habits of the heart. America, they argue, is losing that to individualism, the community spirit. But it's now the emphasis on the individual. Do you think in Singapore we are developing uh, habits of the heart? And is it there? And how can we do better? And I think that is, for me, is a very good topic of research, actually. It is a very and good from topic. your yeah. constituency, you know, what do you see? Yeah. Uh, I mean, of course, my constituency is exceptional and you can't compare it. With <laughs> um, but uh, uh, more seriously, yeah. um, by the way, please don't put that on the record. <laughs> uh, uh, more seriously, I would say, you know, one very I interesting um, uh, challenge we have in Singapore is we have succeeded in avoiding major schisms in society, major divisions, most especially by race and religion, but also socioeconomically. And we've done it. I mean, there are differences between people. There are some widening gaps here and there. But we've avoided the big yawning gaps that you see in many societies, including the most mature democracies. We've done it through an education system that integrated people, through a housing and social urban strategy that integrated people. The latter was unique. The former, some countries have tried to do and with, with success, and we are amongst those countries that have used a public education system where everyone is able to get into schools. There are differences between the schools, but it's far more evenly Socioeconomically, there's a much more even distribution than in most other countries, including, by the way, places like Sweden and France and so on, which are uh, overtly egalitarian in their ethos, but in practice see significant social segregation amongst their schools. So that's how we've done it. Principally, schooling and what I would call social urban planning, which is the way we organize our neighborhoods. So we mix people up in the neighborhood. And as a result, as a nation, as a society at large, we are a united people. But if we had left each neighborhood segregated, just following the normal tendencies that you find in most societies, the natural workings of society lead to people congregating amongst people who are similar to them. Um, better off people, upper middle class, in very different neighborhoods from the lower middle class and the ordinary working class. That's what happens everywhere. And by race and other ethnicity, ethnic characteristics, there'll be some separation. You may well find in that situation that within those neighborhoods, there's a high level of trust. Very high level of trust, social interaction at the neighborhood level, hmm. more so than we do because we mix people up in the neighborhood. Mm -hmm. So when you look at the World Value Survey, and IPS did a very good study of this uh, two years ago, 2021, a thorough analysis of the World Value Survey, you find that um, overall trust amongst people in Singapore is about the same as it is everywhere else. Um, it may not be a very deep indicator, because it's not as if people really deeply distrust people, but you know, there's no country that has a very high level of trust amongst people, and we are sort of somewhere near the average. But at the neighborhood level, we are somewhat at the lower end of the distribution. 
somewhat lower levels of trust at the neighborhood level. Not the lowest, by the way. Something like, I was just looking at the data I pulled out of my pocket. Um, as far as this survey was concerned, about 22% of people at the neighborhood level um, feel they can't quite trust others. Uh, either they strongly distrust, but in the main, it's just that they have some distrust, okay? About 22%. Again, to, to, ex, ex, to uh, highlight how complex this is, you would have thought Japan was a country where people really trust each other, homogenous, they've got such a consensual culture, almost conformist in parts. Mm -hmm. In Japan, we had one of the highest levels of distrust at a neighborhood level amongst people. So think about it. We, there's a lot more nuance mm. in this social fabric that we need to understand. Okay? But, so we, we are not in a comfortable position. You still have 20, I mean, 78% of people trust each other. That's good. It's an achievement. But in a place like Singapore, a small city state, even if 22% of people have some distrust for each other at the local level, we feel we must do better. Okay? We're doing better than Japan, we're doing better than Hong Kong, by the way, where it's higher. But let's not compare ourselves with other countries. We must do better for ourselves because Singapore is a unique social construct. People must get along, they must trust each other, they must have friendships that become deeper over time. So we have to think about that, how we develop it. But the point I'm making is this. Had we not gone for a strategy nationally of mixing people up, so as to achieve this very unusual phenomenon of a country that is peaceful despite being multiracial and the most diverse religion-wise, the most religiously diverse country in the world. Peace, people willing to work, work together and live together. We've achieved that. But we've done it by mixing people up. And so at the neighborhood level, there's more work to be done. And that's a very interesting problem to have because it's a problem of having succeeded at the big thing mm. and you now have to succeed yeah. at the smaller thing which is at the neighborhood level. Actually what you just said was interesting for me as a social scientist because um, we in Singapore we work at it. It's a conscious decision and it's purposeful. The countries where you expect to do well, the places you expect to do well, Japan is homogeneous they don't bother very much. You leave it to chance, doesn't work so well. Hong Kong, the city, is also homogeneous with an expatriate sprinkling, you know, but it's homogeneous. And it's striking to me, as you describe it, is the homogeneous societies which took the kind of unity and cohesion a bit for granted, maybe. Well, that, I, I uh, don't, I mean, I'm guessing. Yeah. Um, I, I would, uh, I would say that um, homogeneity is one of the factors that clearly is related to whether people trust each other. Yeah, uh, whether they've had long histories of living in the neighborhood together is an important factor mm -hmm. as well. But let's try and understand this better. I, I'm, I'm sort of tempted to Disagree. think of it in, um, in the way that Tolstoy thought about unhappy families. <laughs> that each unhappy family is unhappy in its own way. And it may be that each society where trust is low mm -hmm. is, has that low level of trust in its own way. People distrust each other for very distinct reasons in each case. Yes. Sometimes it's that grating of different uh, ethnicities together, but sometimes different ethnicities get along very well together. Yeah. On the whole, I think what we've achieved in Singapore is yeah. something of an oddity, this the peace, but also just the fact that people get along quite well together. But we should do even better. And that data at the neighborhood level is suggestive of how much better we can do. And I believe we can do better. Mm -hmm. We can do better, starting from young, all the way up. Um, actually, we don't have that much time left, but I have several questions from the audience. So I'm going to cut short my questions to transit to the audience, I think they would like you to answer their questions. Uh, let me begin with Audrey Tim. She's from the Young Women's Leadership Connection. 
How can we normalize conversations on failure and experiment to co-create solutions for a resilient society? Okay, it's a very good question. Is there another one that's somewhat like it? You want to take a look, Heng Chi? Gosh. Um... Well, it's a difficult question. I always ask for another one to sort of <laughs> put it together. Right? So. They're all equally difficult, you know. Um, no, I, I think that's, uh, yeah. Okay, that's a good question. I would say uh, it's, it's an interesting uh, trajectory we've been through. Uh, in the generation that had to start working in the 50s, 60s, even 70s, um, when people left school, half of which left school after primary school. Later on, by the time of the 70s, still a very significant number just left school after primary school, and some left after secondary school. And there was no such thing as career planning or career counselling or anything of the sort. People just took what job came. They just took what job came, and many failed at it, and then they moved on to another job. That was the culture. Mm -hmm. That was the culture. If you happen to have a aunt who was a seamstress or someone else related who was a motorcycle mechanic, you joined them. You just tried it. Um, so I would say that the willingness to what we today call experiment, but actually is just take whatever comes, right, was very high in those days. Then we had this very unusual success of an education system that produced, a, you know, successive generations of Singaporeans who are very well prepared for future work, for jobs in a competitive and thriving economy. And the jobs were available. So they didn't have to take what came. In fact, they sort of just had ready-made paths to choose from. And you might be choosing between two or three or four of them. Sometimes, unfortunately, people choose based on cut-off points rather than what they're interested in which has been a real bugbear in my mind. So, but, you know, they had choices because they knew they would get a job. They'd get a place in a tertiary institution and they'd eventually get a job. And that, understandably, understandably, uh, tends to make failure something unattractive and tends to make society as a whole think of failure as, well, something went wrong with you. And now I think we have to go through that S-curve because we are comfortable enough, children have parents' homes, the government has far more supportive schemes for entrepreneurs, startups or restartups, far more support. And I think society is also now looking at this differently, not radically, but it is changing. So now we've got to go through that S-curve um, of once again, viewing failure as a way in which we're going to achieve unusual success, not usual success, the way in which we achieve unusual success in different fields, not just the conventional route, but people doing their own thing, persevering at it, developing deep expertise, and then moving on when something doesn't quite work out. And what I have observed over time in Singapore from meeting people who have succeeded that way, as well as looking overseas, is that nothing is actually completely lost when you fail at something. For sure, you develop some skills in that particular area, and there's always some skills that can be transferred to the next thing you're doing, or the thing you do two, two rounds from there. Skills are transferable. Secondly, it develops something else in you which is deeply transferable, which is resilience. Mm. Failure develops resilience. Mm. It really develops resilience. Yes. And I worry about yeah. social resilience if we had remained a society where everything just carries on the way it did. You're assured of an education, you're assured of a job, incomes go up from year to year. We will be vulnerable to the shocks and crises that come. So I think we are now moving on a new track. You can't do it suddenly. You can't uh, suddenly change course. But we're moving along a new track. And let's make the most of developing resilience in all its different ways. 
It doesn't mean leaving people to fend entirely for themselves. I think there should be government schemes, there should be community schemes, and very importantly, there should be much more extensive and systematic mentorship by people in the business community and in the community to be together with people when they embark on all these ventures. It may be together with someone who's got an interesting startup idea, someone who's moving into a whole new area, or it may be people who are just picking up the pieces after having had a setback. Mentorship is critical. And I say this for a, a broader region, region, reason. There was a very good piece by Han Fu Kuang in this latest Sunday Times, which would be the 7th of May. And I think it was called Don't Treat the Poor as Needy and um, Helpless. Don't treat the poor as needy and helpless. It accorded very much with not only my views, but my experience of dealing with people in difficulty. I'm not a great fan of running around the neighborhoods delivering food packets. Well, you know, you need some of it. But don't treat people in a condescending way. People need to be empowered, they need friendship, and they need social connectedness. That's what they need. Those who are, wanting, those who are young and wanting to do something but lack the background or had early gaps in life, they need to be empowered. That's very different from being patronizing and just giving them handouts. People will take it, but you know, it's, at the end of the day, it gives no dignity and doesn't give you real confidence. Older folk, they need help, but most of all, they need friendship, they need the social connection, they need someone who's persuading them to come and join in a dance activity or bingo at the CC, or let's go bird watching. That's what they need. It's emotional. And this is not just a social issue, it's a health issue. Because social disconnectedness, loneliness, is a very strong predictor of tumbling down the health ladder. Disconnectedness has the same consequences for risk of heart failure, strokes, other ailments, as being a daily smoker. Mm. It's a very serious health issue. Yeah. So you then get loneliness combining with the deterioration in your own faculties, the setting in of dementia, the other physiological problems that come in, and it becomes a spiral. It's a very serious issue, by the way, because we now have 68,000 elderly single living on their own. Elderly is living on their own, above 65, 68,000, and it's going to grow. So we need to wire our neighborhoods, do the social wiring and also the infrastructural wiring of the neighborhoods to make them basically elderly friendly. And Belinda Yuan at um, mm. your center has been doing very good work on this, amongst others. That's a key priority. Make every neighborhood elderly friendly, not just in the sense of ramps, but they've got to be places where the elderly feel, it's a nice morning, let me go out. Let me meet my friends. And someone will pop in to see them as well. So that's critical to social health, to physical health, but that's, that's what it takes. It's, a, it's not demeaning, it involves people in a way that they feel that they're part of a circle. They're part of a circle. There's a sense of mutual reliance. And, you know, we are drawing on a lot of our traditional values in that regard. People don't you know, many of our people don't actually want to be dependent, but they want to get help when they really need it. Yeah. It's like, yeah. you know, the, many of you will be familiar. I meet them all the time in my constituency. You meet especially the older generation, and you want to give them some help because you know actually they've gone through some difficulty. A spouse has passed away, and so on, you offer help. But very often, they'll tell you, yeah. uh, help others first. When I really need help, I'll come to you. Help others first. 
帮别人。嗯。And it's quite a deep culture, you know. Help others first, but it's not as if they're just being self-reliant. They know that actually there's a sense, there is a system of mutual reliance. When they need help, they'll be able to get help. Otherwise, help others. And if you ask them to also, hey, can you help your neighbour? By the way, you know, just pop in and keep an eye and have some chit chat. They're very happy to. So our traditional mores、mm-hmm. are useful, and we need to refresh them. But that wiring of the neighbourhood. That social and physical wiring of the neighborhood is very important. We are blessed with those neighborhoods. We are blessed with the fact that they are mixed neighborhoods, and we now have to make the best of it for social reasons.、Uh, you've also spoken of、uh, senior minister along some these lines about the older population, you know, who have lost work over the pandemic. And they cannot find work, and some of them have to be retrained. How do you think the PPP, you know, relationships, partnerships, can be activated to help this? Well, I think fundamentally, employers have to take the high road、um, because they are part of Singapore.、Uh, it's not bad for their business; it'll be good for their business because a motivated employee. One that feels included、uh, makes for a better business itself. But they have to take the high road because they have a social responsibility as well. It's not just the business. If every employer does their part for that small number of elderly, lower-paid workers, we achieve a lot. We achieve a lot. And again, just like we were talking about food versus social connections in the neighbourhood. Again, it's not just the pay. The pay is important, I believe, and we, we are significantly upgrading pay through the progressive wage model for a whole range of low-paid professions, and the elderly are disproportionately represented in some of them. But it's not just the pay; it's that sense of being treated with dignity at the workplace. Treated with dignity at the workplace. That the Japanese are very good at, by the way. They're very good at it. Uh, Senior Minister, I'm told you have to leave soon, and I have to end the dialogue. But can we just have a two-minute answer to one question? I've got so many questions here. Do you mind? Sure. Fergus Jess from the Bahai community. How do you see mutual support and collaboration thrive in an environment where competitive values? Are promoted, and being ahead of the game is encouraged. So that is a challenge, but not a inherent、uh, contradiction.、Uh, you can be a competitive society with com- a competitive ethos that we develop from young, and have a sense of togetherness. It's one of the things, by the way, that is a strength in some of the Scandinavian countries. Uh, small European countries. Since I knocked Northern Europe earlier, I'll give them some praise here. Some of the Northern European countries, you know, they're very competitive. You know, innovative and competitive. That's true. But they've got a strong sense of social togetherness.、Yeah. Uh, if you look at some of those societies, the Swedes, the Norwegians, the Finns.、Um, so it's not an inherent contradiction. I think in Singapore we've overdone the sharp. Edge of meritocracy. We are now moving towards a broader meritocracy, where we recognise many different merits and skills and talents, and we are moving towards a more continuous meritocracy, where it's not just the grades you earned early in life, but it's that constant upgrading and ability to contribute with new skills through life that is recognised. Still a meritocratic framework, but we are broadening it and extending it through life. And as you do that, you're also creating creating a greater recognition of the different people in your midst as you grow up.、Mm-hmm. That it wasn't just you being ultra good in pure maths, but someone was actually very good at floorball or hockey、mm-hmm. in ways that you can't compete in at all. So celebrate every every type of talent. Celebrate the sports person. Celebrate the artists. Celebrate those who are just good at. Who've got very good EQ and have a way of、um, getting their friends 
to, to come along and do something interesting. So that broader meritocracy is also, it has a different social ethos attached to it. Well, I think on that note, that was a positive note, so... It's a positive note. We'll uh, end this dialogue. And thank you very much for giving us the time. And I thank the audience for being such a good audience and sending in so many questions. I really feel sorry that uh, we haven't had a chance to actually uh, give you the questions from the two universities and top board as well and other uh, CSOs. Yeah, so. Good. Thank you for the opportunity. Thank you. Thank you, Thank you, SM Taman and Prof Chan for the engaging discussion. May we please invite SM Taman to remain on stage for the next segment. Now, we would like to invite Professor Chong Kun Hien, Chair of Lee Kuan Yew Centre for Innovative Cities, Mr. Janadas Devan, Director of Institute of Policy Studies, and Mrs. Mildred Tan, Chairman of Tote Board, on stage for the launch of the Future Ready Society Impact Fund. We will now begin the launch. We have prepared four messages conveying the aspirations of the fund. First, Mrs. Mildred Tan, please reveal the first message by placing your left hand on the button in front of you until our message appears. The Future Ready Society Impact Fund was created to drive greater social impact. Next, may we invite SM Taman to place your left hand on the button in front of you to reveal the next message. And we do so by partnering the community. Mr. Janadas Devan, please place your right hand on the button for the third message. In order to co-create innovative solutions, and finally, Prof Chong, will you place your right hand on the button for the final message? All this brings us closer to being a future-ready society. The photographers will be taking a picture of this woman. May we please invite the four of you on stage to place your hands on the buttons again. Alright, to prepare for the launch, SM Taman and Mrs Tan, may we invite you to move to my side of the stage, while Mr Devan and Prof Chong, please move to the other end of the stage. Now, let's count down from... 5, 4, 3, 2, 1! The Future Ready Society Impact Fund is now launched! Now, may we invite the four of you to move towards the centre of the stage for another photo. Thank you SM Taman and our guests for launching the Future Ready Society Impact Fund.